faced. I think he makes an excellent point uh, that when you have generalized uh, retail corruption, as we appear to do, uh, as we appear to have in this country, uh, uh, it, you know, going after the big fish is, in a sense, uh, the solution. Uh, and of course, if you look at the political economy of corruption uh, in India specifically, uh, it seems to be driven by wholesale corruption. And beyond that, uh, large-scale political uh, corruption linked to deficiencies in the uh, campaign uh, finance system, uh, as well as pure greed. And uh, in a sense, as, as Vinod Rai, who, who's a pioneer in this, uh, mentioned, uh, 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 this is also partly driven by the emergence of large corporate interests uh, that, that operate uh, through a crony capitalist uh, uh, system. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, starting with the big fish is, a, is, is, a, is, is the right signal to send right across the system. It, it, it has all sorts of reverberations. Now, with respect to the principal agent model, rephrasing the, uh, the, the, the sort of wholesale retail uh, uh, dynamic, uh, in a sense, the principles are in bed with the agents. Uh, it, the immediate principles, the politicians, the policy makers, some, are in bed with the uh, retail providers. And, and you can map out the chain of sharing of, of proceeds from, say, something as, as, as mundane as the mutation of a, of a registration deed all the way up. It's no accident that sub-registrars uh, keep changing their posts every six months because uh, there's, there's a very active market uh, in posts. Again, I agree with Vinod Rai. You can't just take a standardized approach to the problem of corruption. Uh, it's unique. It dimensions rest uh, in the political economy of, of each country. Uh, uh, you know, which, you know, the, the sort of, uh, 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 in, in a sense, uh, uh, built up over several uh, years. Now, uh, let me start the presentation. I, that's, that's why, essentially, I, I was feeling of agreement with, with Bob Titcott's point. Let me, let me really start by, you know, with this presentation, which will focus on the sort of getting the big fish, uh, 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 you know, by saying, look, there's no magic bullet to resolve this problem. There is no single solution. Uh, there are a bunch of things you have to do. I thought the presentations on contracting this morning were rather good, and uh, that has to be done. But on the other hand, you need to have aggressive anti-corruption institutions. But clearly, that approach, which, uh, which uh, sort of mushroomed all over the world in the 80s and 90s, uh, has now given way to a more mature approach that says, look, these anti-corruption agencies are one part of the puzzle. What you actually need is better management in the public sector uh, as a whole, as well as greater transparency uh, and, and, and accountability uh, in the system. More importantly, uh, there's a lot of pressure now through various conventions, uh, whether it's Money Laundering Convention, the Inter-American Convention on, uh, uh, against uh, Corruption, uh, uh, the UN Convention Against Corruption, this, this idea of standard setting uh, in the globe. You know, I, I think that that is, again, putting pressure, especially on the smaller countries, uh, to sort of sign on uh, to these uh, uh, international uh, conventions. So that, that is, is another factor that we should certainly uh, keep in mind. Now, broadly, uh, if you look at, say, all of the anti-corruption uh, agencies globally, what you see are certain patterns. Some, some of them are single agency models where, you know, the, uh, responsibility for addressing corruption rests primarily in that agency. Others fall, follow more pluralistic kind of approach. I would say that India is sort of institutionally more plural. In fact, this was the debate really between uh, Kejriwal and people like Shekhar Singh and uh, others from the NCPRI. Were you going to have a single thrust on this all-powerful Jan Lokpal, or were you going to sort of have a variety of instruments uh, to deal with, with corruption? And I think, I think we're, we're heading in a way towards a sort of a more plural uh, approach. Some ACAs have investigative functions but not prosecution functions. So it's not clear that all ACAs have to have prosecution functions, uh, you know, uh, un unlike what a lot of people say. Certainly public education is, is, is a critical uh, part of the puzzle. Now, some of the good practices among ACAs, well, obviously, citizen outreach, building alliances with the citizenry, and as, as, as Bob Tidcard mentioned, involving the private sector in the analysis of corruption itself, turning to uh, the problem in part to resolve to be part of the solution. Uh, hiring technical staff directly. This is a huge you know, battle. I mean, uh, you know, anti-corruption agencies often find themselves saddled with bureaucrats who've been turned over to them for a period of two or three years, and obviously they, their loyalty is more to the parent department 
and the head of the anti-corruption agency can't really trust them. This was a problem with the Karnataka Loka Yoke. Most of the police uh, came from uh, the police department, and in fact, it was not clear how many of them were actually honest. Uh, 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 independence in budget setting and objective procedures for appointment and removal of commissioners, plus holding the anti-corruption agency to account. Because after all, you don't want these uh, you know, J. Edgar Hoover kinds of institutions to emerge that then actually even uh, overawe the political uh, system. So you actually have to watch the watchdog. Uh, so it's, it's quite, uh, quite complex. Now, uh, I was asked to sort of pull out a few international examples, uh, 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 and I'm happy happy to do so. Uh, the Indonesian case is pretty instructive. I mean, again, let me just focus on some of the causality here, because it, it runs through the cases I'm going to talk about, Bhutan, Indonesia, uh, and, and India. Clearly, in, in Indonesia, the political and economic context is critical. Crony capitalism, Asian financial crisis, the fall of the strongman, wave of indignation, creation of a KPK uh, anti-corruption agency to combat uh, corruption. And, you know, it was pretty well staffed. Uh, uh, five commissioners, 700 plus officers, this sort of thing. And it was a, a, a sort of relatively um, a sort of wide uh, uh, mandate, coordination, supervision, investigation, prosecution, prevention, and review of systems. Uh, this slide is from a presentation that uh, Chandra Hamza made uh, at the World Bank a, a few years ago. And as you can see in the subsequent uh, slide, uh, they have done uh, quite a remarkable job for ministers, prosecuted members of parliaments, ambassadors, provincial government, governors. But there was a terrific backlash when this started to happen. And some of you may know that in 2009, uh, the head of the commission was, was accused of a very serious crime, not clear whether this was ever committed by him. Uh, two commissioners were almost hounded out, uh, and then there was a civil society reaction to that, and uh, uh, it, the, the political consensus underlying this agency uh, began to to fray. Now, Bhutan, I think, is a country that uh, India can learn a great deal from. Uh, Bhutan is actually the, and I work quite a bit in Bhutan, it's a country I'm rather fond of, uh, and it's a country that inspires fondness. Um, Bhutan is, is the least corrupt country in South Asia. It ranks 38th out of 183 countries on the Corruption Perception Index, um, compared to India, which is in a rather sad uh, 95th uh, place. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the things you notice in Bhutan, and we had this debate about right to information, we were trying to sort of push right to information, they were saying, look, but we have a great deal of trust between citizens and government, why do we need RTI? You're spoiling the show. Uh, you're sort of uh, uh, introducing, uh, you're sort of taking us out of our innocence. And there is some truth to that, it's a Mahayana Buddhist state, and the, the Mahayana Buddhist ideology has sort of been transmuted into a secular ideology of, of gross national uh, happiness. Uh, the government, however, did adopt a, a fairly strong anti-corruption agency because they felt that as the country opened up democratically and as well as economically, uh, they were going to get lots of foreign investment, particularly in forestry and hydropower. And many of these investors were actually Indian. And the feeling was that this could generate quite a bit of corruption. And so uh, 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 they went and created a very powerful watchdog. And uh, if you've met the head of uh, the Bhutan Anti-Corruption Agency, she is uh, a remarkable uh, woman. Now, uh, it has direct prosecution powers. It plays a preventive role, helping agencies map out corruption risks, take remedial actions. Uh, they have fairly tough investigation techniques that are allowed by the law. And the offenses are specified in a single uh, uh, law, along with penalties. Net, uh, a mechanism has been created for international corporations, so relating to freezing of assets, uh, uh, property transfers, transfers of, uh, of, of, of accused, and, and that kind of thing. And they simplified the asset declaration rules. Now, this asset declaration rules is actually quite interesting because, um, you know, in, in their enthusiasm, they said, well, if an official fails to declare his or her assets, that official will be impeached by, uh, by the assembly. And, of course, the assembly is very reluctant to impeach anybody, so in practice nobody filed their asset declarations and nobody was impeached. So they, you know, a few years later they decided, look, let's water this down, only senior officials will declare their assets and there'll be a, a kind of cascade of penalties uh, to deal with it. One thing about Bhutan is their sensitivity to international standards. Again, a small country looking to uncac, uh, rather touching in their faith in international standards, 
uh, I, I, my own personal bias is there are too many standards coming from, the, uh, coming from all sorts of places. And uh, I think countries, you know, this stifles the creativity of countries, but it does help develop cross-national coalitions uh, to deal with issues as well. So I'm a little skeptical about standards, but I, I don't want to go there at the moment. But clearly, UNCAC standards played a big role uh, in Bhutan's decision to adopt a new anti-corruption act in 2011. Let me talk a little about, a bit about the Lokpal Act, passed here uh, and ratified by the President uh, Mukherjee on the 1st of January. I think it was the 1st, yeah, so that illustrates the government's enthusiasm. I think it's quite a good bill, personally. Um, I, you know, whatever people say, it's not a joke, Pal. It's, it is a serious anti-corruption agency, no question about it. Uh, objective Selection Committee, uh, Prime Minister, leader of, you know, the, the, the Chief Justice, eminent jurist, uh, and then uh, I think it's the uh, Speaker of the House, right? Or is it the Leader of the Opposition? I can't remember. But it's, it's balanced, uh, whereas it was not balanced earlier on. So that meets one of the criteria, objectivity and selection. I, I think it's pretty solid. Sanction to prosecute no longer needed. But if you look at the wording, it doesn't say sanction to investigate an inquiry no longer needed. Uh, that's a, I think that was just an unintentional omission in the drafting of the law. And I'm hoping that they will correct that. Because what it says was after getting comments from the competent authority, the Lokpal can go ahead and sanction prosecution. It does not mention inquiry and investigation. But that may be presumed to be part of the term prosecution. Uh, let's see what the courts rule uh, on that. Uh, includes the PM and ministers and MLAs. Uh, there's a performance report that has to be submitted. Uh, it has its own inquiry and prosecution wings. The question is how will these be staffed and by whom? And again there I think there's some ambiguity. Government has not fully given up administrative control, although the Lokpal can uh, reject officers that are seconded uh, to him. Uh, this is important. Uh, it's narrow, but it's important. There's a bar on transferring investigating officers, uh, uh, investing a case under the Lokpal. However, the ACR of that officer is written by his superior in the CBI. So they don't, it's very ambiguous time limits on investigations and rulings, referral of cases from other laws involving a service delivery angle uh, that deal with corruption, and mandatory asset declarations for all public servants at the central government level. Not bad, good solid B plus. Uh, going back to my academic days, uh, my students used to get very upset with me because I was regarded as a strict grader. Now, uh, limitations. As I said, superintendence is not the same thing as administrative control. What happened? Yeah, superintendence is not the same thing as administrative control. Uh, ACRs or IOs, I've made that point. Uh, here, I think there's a real fear of overburdening the CVC and the Lokpal. You've got your A, B, C, and D uh, uh, officers, all of whom have to be investigated uh, by the CVC on referral from the Lokpal. Uh, with A and B being prosecuted by the Lokpal. Now, how are you going to prosecute some peon in some far-flung region of the country using the CBC uh, uh, or even a Class B officer, a teacher who doesn't show up, or a doctor? Uh, the might of the Lokpal in Delhi falls upon them. It seems a little disproportionate. Uh, and this is with respect to central government employees. And I think the concern of some groups that, uh, like a, a, a NCPRI, that you know, you're really overwhelming the machinery of, of anti-corruption is, is justified to some degree. No independent agency to address complaints against Lokpal staff. And state governments are free, and this is the real problem, but it's a concession to Indian federalism, which is, as you know, more and more assertive. State governments are free to uh, adopt any kind of Lokpal they want. So you'll get a Karnataka Lokpal, which is quite good. You'll get an Uttarakhand Lokpal, which is quite good. A Bihar, which is quite good. But you may also get some very lousy ones. And uh, so, you know, you know, this is by no means a full solution. Now, as I said, anti-corruption agencies is, is just one part of the puzzle. You have to build up a broader framework of accountability. I think the Indian RTI Act certainly has done that. And it's become part of the folklore of, of Indian uh, democracy. And it's revealing that, that the two parties, the one thing they agreed on was that parties should not be included in the Lokpal. In, in, the, in the Right to Information Act, but of course this was derailed uh, subsequently. One key challenge and, uh, is this whole question of Section 4 disclosure in the, in the Right to Information Bill. 
the fact that we haven't really computerized networks, network records as well as we could have. Because there's a lot of interpolation, records can disappear or made to, be, made to disappear, uh, or they can be retrieved or made to be retrieved, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And uh, because you're focusing a lot on requests, uh, the information commissions are getting clogged. So uh, there's a slow pendency, and when that happens, the information commissions lose credibility. And people say, well, you know, I give up. And it's not clear that the best people, according to some activists, are being appointed uh, to the right to information commissions. And of course, you know, there's this feeling that with so many commissions being created, these are wonderful post-retirement sinecures uh, for eager favorites uh, uh, to be rewarded by, by their political friends. But then, of course, you want to be able to create mechanisms of selection that mitigate against that. I think Mexico has done a fantastic job on RTI. This is, again, the product of a long struggle against the one-party state. Uh, and uh, you can see some of the benefits. Uh, requests for information have to be made di digitally. There's no other way. It's done anonymously, which means that you don't get into this intimidation of RTI activists problem that you have here. A transparency portal contains critical information on services, tenders, budgets, and more importantly, citizens can search the database for RTI requests as well as uh, answers to that. So if you find the answer to your question on, on a database, you don't need to ask the question uh, and this kind of thing. Now, you know, the advantages of Infomex, the request filing system, is not just anonymity, but it, it also helps you monitor requests, you never lose requests, it's completely free, uh, there's no very low transaction costs, and it also allows you to correct personal information, demand personal information from government and correct it. And Zoom also we talked about. Now, uh, again, moving back to the uh, management of the public sector and uh, the larger transparency and accountability framework, uh, there are these time-bound service delivery laws, and Dr. Rajneesh will talk about that in her presentation and I think, I think the point here is that services are a right. It's not a dispensation. Uh, it's not patronage. You have a right to get your ration card, your passport. You have a right to live freely as a citizen, equipped with all the documents necessary uh, for that. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. Uh, I had to change the, the, the water mutation. The, I had to mutate my water connection. Uh, and uh, I, I said my, my, my wife went to the water, to the jal board, five times over five months or six times, and they just gave her the runaround. So finally, I tried to find the citizen's charter. And I had to dig and dig and dig, go through about eight websites. Then I came up with this grubby-looking circular issued to all jal board officials in the, in the various zones that they had to process a mutation request within five days or reject it. And there was no appeal process there. So I took it. And I went to the JAL board, and, and I tried to find the appeals process. It said zonal revenue officer in tiny print. Uh, again, it, it took me about two hours to find this. And I presented him with this. And he said, well, look, this is just a piece of paper. So I said, well, I'll go to the zonal revenue officer. He said, well, no, no, no need to do that, sir. We'll do it. Come back later. So I came back in 45 minutes. <laughs> the mutation was done after five minutes. This is in a city that says they have a right to public services act. Now, uh, you know, this is very instructive for me. I, I found it fascinating. I was quite happy to play along uh, uh, with it. Uh, but clearly, uh, something has to be done. Uh, uh, and I, I didn't want to use any influence. You know, call up the Jalbot chairman and say, look, you know, I, I, I need my water mutation. I, I refuse to do that. Now, Government of India is trying to address this problem uh, by defining charters. Uh, you know, what is a charter? What are the quality standards? Uh, uh, what are the appeal processes, laying down penalties, and creating a structure of commissions to hear grievances. Uh, there is this issue that they might be interfering with state right to public service acts, but I don't think the GOI law requires that the GOI get involved in setting timelines. This is still very much with public authorities in the states, and, and they will have to sort this out uh, when the, if this ever comes up for legislation, there's talk about passing it as an ordinance. Now, what are some of the lessons of all of this, to wrap up. The first thing is corruption requires political consensus. For the last 40 or 50 years, in India, as far as I can see, there has been very little consensus among the political players to address corruption seriously. I mean, you have the Santanam Committee, you have the First Administrative Forms Committee under Moraji Desai, you have Virapa Moili, you have amendments to the Prevention of Corruption Act, but basically the system has not moved. 
while corruption has zoomed, starting at the top level in the 1970s and then spreading like a cancer throughout the system. How do you disrupt this, this consensus? You can disrupt it because of a crisis, the Asian financial crisis in the case of Indonesia. You can disrupt it because of pressure from below. And it seems that pressure from below has been cooking, partly because of the egregiousness of some of the scams, whether it's 2G or CWG. They're just so egregious that people realize this. The social networking and media factor, the growing middle class composition of Indian society, uh, and, uh, uh, and it seems that now this, this consensus is being disrupted, finally. Uh, it's naive to suppose that a strong ACA will, in, will resolve retail corruption, and uh, the, the key really is in uh, better public management, whether it's curtailing premature transfers uh, or, or things like that, improving monitoring. Why do we have such weak monitoring of teacher absenteeism? Because the unions in places like West Bengal are strong, uh, the DEO is in cahoots with the teacher, uh, and, and various factors like that. Straight monitoring, and not complicated monitoring. Uh, in ICDS, for instance, there are 17 reporting formats that Anganwadis have to fill up. This is crazy. You should have one or two, maybe use smartphones to monitor, monitor it, crowdsource monitoring, and, and all kinds of things. Now, finally, uh, just to conclude, and I'm sorry if my slides have gotten a little mixed up, uh, just to conclude, let's not assume that it's all about incentives and institutions. Uh, there is a moral core in society. Uh, if I have to deal with my neighbor every day on the assumption that he's a scoundrel and that only the police will protect me, we are really in bad shape. So I, I really have to focus on developing social trust, social capital, civic virtue, some of this comes from a progressive interpretation of religion. Some of it comes from civic education in schools. Some of it comes from the way we treat our family members and the community. Uh, we have to establish the sense of interconnectedness with each other. Uh, and I think this has happened in India. Uh, certainly, uh, we're a long way from the days, uh, you know, the previous century where, you know, you know even, you know, in intercaste dining might have been uh, frowned upon. Uh, this is now, you know, a century later, has, has eroded completely. Uh, but, but it is a fragmented society, and fragmented societies have levels of low trust. So I, 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 institutions are only part of the puzzle. We really have to focus on the larger aspects of building up a society that has a minimum standard of civic morality. Otherwise, uh, 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 we'll be living out a nightmare.